Love Katamari is one of my top favorite games of all time. It hit at the perfect time during the PS2 era, where I was looking for experiences that were outside of the norm. As ridiculous as it may seem now, that included games like GTA San Andreas for the sheer complexity and richness of its open world, which was uncommon at the time even though open worlds themselves were becoming increasingly common. Games like Guitar Hero were only just entering the scene, Devil May Cry was finally coming into its own with the third entry, and was still basically the only hack and slash that actually had a meaningful amount of mechanical depth. In comes Katamari Damacy, and then We Love Katamari, both of which stole the hearts of anyone who was in the know enough to play them. I remember the magazines barely covering Katamari, even after they'd gotten their hands on it. It wasn't until it was actually coming to the West that attention was squarely put on it. Nobody who had played it wanted anyone else to miss it. Suddenly, it was getting pretty significant attention, much more than I think Namco ever anticipated. I remember how interesting it was that the original Katamari was just $20 brand new, and We Love was $30. This was in a time before online game marketplaces on consoles, so if you released a new game on a console, it was almost guaranteed it'd cost the whole $50 that your biggest AAA releases did. By contrast, the Katamari titles were bargain games, but they had the polish and care put into them that you'd get from a Smash Bros, or a God of War, or a Halo. Katamari's pricing wasn't Namco's answer to Phoenix Games or Activision 02. It was their way of trying to give this quirky series a real chance at life, and it worked. If there was an opportunity to talk about games with someone new back then, We Love Katamari was often my go-to. If I got to show games to someone who didn't play them, I either went to the astonishing graphical presentation of Gran Turismo 4, or I picked We Love Katamari for its wonderfully natural controls and carefree aesthetic. Katamari channels the same feelings that I love about my favorite holiday, Halloween. It feels like a party in the streets where society as a whole wakes up for a day of simply getting along. Katamari was simultaneously a wonderful game for getting people to understand the unique artistic value what games could provide, and also light enough to be enjoyably addicting along the way. People didn't want to stop playing it once they'd started, no matter who they were, and co-op was sure to bring the comedic bliss with just a tinge of frustration, almost as if Keita Takahashi wanted the experience to have the slightest rough edges for flavor. I explain all of this so that you know how big of a fan of Katamari I was, and still am. Top 5 dormant series that I wish could be revived in a meaningful capacity with a new game? Katamari is always going to be in there for me. Heck, I'd settle for a We Love Katamari re-roll. But my point is, this series is part of my lifeblood. It makes up a tangible portion of who I am as a person. So. It shouldn't be surprising that I was desperately excited for Beautiful Katamari in 2007. It was already out by the time I got a 360, and other than the price of the console, access to Lost Odyssey, and Mass Effect, which was 360 exclusive at the time, as well as getting Forza 2 and Marvel's Ultimate Alliance for free, Beautiful Katamari was one of the deciding factors in my choice to go with Microsoft instead of Sony for the first half of that console generation. No joke, Beautiful Katamari was a legitimate system seller for me. It still would be around a year until I could actually find a copy though. Not exactly a surprise that the Xbox audience wouldn't offer it much support, meaning copies were in short supply. The only reason I ever even got my hands on it was because my brother saw it at a Walmart while he was staying at my grandparents' house for a week with his best friend. They were literally heading back here in just a few hours, and as a parting gift, my grandparents allowed my brother and his friend to browse the shelves for a cheap game. They lived out in the middle of nowhere, so that copy of Beautiful Katamari must have been the only one the store ordered, and it was probably sitting there since release. I told my brother to tell our grandparents to pick it up, and that I'd pay them when they arrived. Thankfully, they agreed, so I spent the next five or so hours playing Modern Warfare 2 online, because Microsoft was currently offering a free weekend of Xbox Live Gold, and playing the Beautiful Katamari demo. 
The anticipation was unreal, only matched at the time by how excited I'd been to play Mass Effect 1, Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion, and the Orange Box. And once I had the game in my hands, I played through it in a single sitting. Then I just kept playing, and kept playing. I played Beautiful Katamari a lot. But then... I... stopped. Eventually, I got a PS3 and played my brother's copy of Katamari Forever a lot. And I always went back to We Love Katamari, whether it was to play through the entire game from scratch again, just to play a few levels, collect a few thousand roses, or even for my review of it in 2016. There's a reason I reviewed We Love first, even though it was easier to do Beautiful Katamari through my Elgato capture device at the time. But why didn't I play Beautiful Katamari anymore? Sure, the bulk of its best content was available in Katamari Forever, but I still played We Love and Demasi. The last time I played Beautiful Katamari was in 2014, before I even started this channel, but the last time I played through it, and only the second time overall, was in like 2010. It's not like Katamari is a particularly complex game to get right, and Beautiful Katamari does get a lot right. You can tell that a lot of heart and soul is there as soon as you start the game. The music is still on point. The visuals are better than ever. A lot of what the king says to you is spot on. The cousin and present designs are some of the best in the series, though I'm saddened by the exclusion of the princess, who was always my favorite. It's arguable that most of the important parts of the aesthetic experience are completely intact. What's more, the game does offer tangible improvements. It's now targeting 60 FPS. It definitely doesn't always hit that target, but that's better than the 20 to 30 you can often get in the first two titles. When you do well enough on a stage, you can earn Eternal Mode for it, allowing you to roll without the time limit, which is a great way to relax and just take in the intricate details of the object placement. Seriously, it can be great fun to actually explore the thousands and thousands of little scenes that were placed throughout the levels individually by level designers instead of rolling it up without a second thought. These are literally like games built out of easter eggs. Anyway, you can make the Katamari bigger than ever in this game. It no longer stops at picking up chunks of land, but instead transitions to picking up entire mountain ranges, countries, and eventually whole celestial bodies. This isn't a gimmick like the credits of Katamari Damacy. It's a seamless part of the later normal levels. Speaking of seamless, they got rid of the mid-level loading, so now when the camera and level expands, you're just immediately in it. The game doesn't skip a beat outside of performance issues. In a lot of ways, Beautiful Katamari is everything I could have wanted and hoped for. It's no wonder that I continued to play it a lot right after I bought it. It's not a surprise that during the era where I never bought DLC, it was among Final Fantasy XIII 2, Lost Odyssey, and Blue Dragon as one of the only games I actually contemplated buying the DLC for anyway. But again, why didn't I come back to it later? Playing through it again for this video, on a whim and because it's a short game, illustrated exactly why. I'm torn on this game. I don't know how to describe my feelings for it. It's not a bad game by any means, and again, it has a lot of the charm the series is known for. But in all the ways you'd think are least important to the experience, it feels like it's empty or unfinished. Remember how Katamari Damacy had a quirky story about the king screwing up the cosmos and the prince being tasked with cleaning it up, all while those two kids watched from afar? Remember how We Love Katamari actually told a pretty affecting tale of the king's past, the complicated twists and turns of growing up that left him who he is today? Remember how We Love also offered a meta-narrative about how people liked the first game so much that all the levels are requests from fans of the first game and the king? Beautiful Katamari has none of that. You get a prologue cutscene without any narration that lasts about a minute, in this cutscene, the king is playing tennis and hits the ball so hard he creates a black hole that destroys a bunch of stuff in the cosmos. Oops, it looks like this is just Katamari Damacy's story again. 
you then get nothing until the epilogue at the end, where you're offered one more short scene without narration that basically just amounts to, yay, you fixed everything. It honestly feels like what you'd get from a spin-off game made for smartphones or something, where you have to buy each level separately and spend energy to play them. Bare minimum doesn't even really do justice to how basic this is, which hurts. Remember the levels in the first two games that offered alternative ways to roll? Like the one where your Katamari always rolls forward, or the one where you're trying to get to an exact size without the size meter, or where you can only pick up a certain amount of objects. There are three levels with alternative goals in Beautiful Katamari. One where you roll the king around, picking up specific types of objects as the king reminisces without a time limit. But this just adds an extra counter to the final score. Picking up things that he requests is entirely optional. And also, it's more or less just the final level of the game again, extended a bit at the beginning, and for a second time. They do move objects around to some degree, but not much. The other two more specialized levels have you picking up ring-shaped things, again, just a separate counter because you can't pick up too few rings and fail, and picking up hot things while avoiding cold things to reach 10,000 degrees Celsius. This last one is the only level that provides a substantially different way to play, and is arguably the hardest level in the entire series. It's a good level. Every other level is just a time limit and a size goal, though now the king optionally wants you to primarily compose the Katamaris of one specific type of object each time, like powerful objects or ocean objects, but this is again a completely optional thing that doesn't change how you roll in any meaningful way. There are no levels where you're underwater. There's nothing like the level where you're picking up fireflies, or the one with flowers. No sumo wrestler ones, or anything like the one where it counts the cost for all the objects you pick up because you're trying to make a rich katamari. There really aren't that many levels anyway though, because without including the DLC, I beat every single stage in a little over two and a half hours. And what's more, the game more or less only offers like four starting areas that are all part of one larger central area. I don't think a single level doesn't take place in this vaguely Japanese town outside of a city on a larger continent in the world. Maybe they did this for reasons related to the seamless loading, or maybe they did it specifically because the seamless loading convinced them that the connectedness of this world was more important than level variety. But whatever the reasoning is, you always start either in the town or in one of the buildings in the town and expand outward to the same areas. It doesn't help that these areas are already reminiscent of ones you'd find in the first two games. Even object placement can often be the same or very similar across the levels, and when enough of the object placement is the same, the player has a tendency to take the same optimal routes through the levels, meaning that they will play almost identically for large stretches of time. Sure, the object placement is still interesting in terms of the world it crafts around you, but it doesn't feel alive anymore a lot of the time. It feels like an act, a ride built for you, rather than the natural chaos of a world without problems or inhibitions. It doesn't feel like Halloween night. It feels like going through the same haunted house on Halloween night 10 times in a row. The controls also just don't feel as good as before, because the sticks on the 360 pad aren't symmetrical. It still does technically control perfectly in terms of actual design. Nothing is tangibly different in relation to the game's design, and the 60 FPS means it's more responsive than ever, but the controller itself just makes the whole thing feel wrong to me. It doesn't feel like the wonder of the intuitive controls would translate to non-gamers near as well on a 360 pad. Like I said earlier, I'm torn on Beautiful Katamari. A lot of its weaknesses are present at least to some degree in the original title, even if they're not there in We Love. And it feels smoother than the previous games, while also going bigger in terms of scale. It's a perfectly solid Katamari game, but something about it is just wrong. It feels like I'm caught between my love for the series and the exact reasons why Keita Takahashi wasn't interested in continuing the series in the first place, a frustration with sequels and creative stagnation. 
it feels like the perfectly prophesied game that he was trying to avoid. It's a game that simultaneously understands what I love about Katamari as an experience, but completely fails to understand why I play Katamari as a game. That's the closest I can get, I guess. Maybe the game's issues stem from it being one of those early Japanese games that committed to Xbox 360 exclusivity for some reason. Or maybe the problem was that Namco didn't have faith in it to sell on the Xbox, so they gave a small budget series an even smaller budget to play it safe. I don't know why this title ended up coming out so uninspired, but it breaks my heart that that's the end result. Beautiful Katamari is definitely the worst home console Katamari title, despite still being perfectly playable and enjoyable. I just can't overcome the fact that, in a strange way, it feels like it somehow sterilized the soul of the series by surrounding it with a game that's so bland and repetitive to play. I can't stress how thankful I am that Katamari Forever didn't meet the same fate and instead feels alive again. It may be almost entirely unoriginal, but it packs as much as it possibly can into that unoriginal package, and it feels like it has that flair and spark again. If I had to describe Beautiful Katamari as simply as possible, it's like if you took the complex flavors that Katamari usually brings to the table and tried to put them into a potato chip. It's never going to taste like the real thing. You can get brief glimpses of the more complex flavor profile you lust for when you first put the chip in your mouth. But eventually, when all the flavoring has worn off, you'll realize that all you're really eating are slightly fancy salted potatoes. Yeah, you